the topic is management of respiratory emergencies deal with the session uh, under these headings like uh, what are the major respiratory emergencies uh, that uh, we would face in the casualty how to assess the respiratory patient and what are the common presentations and management of the individual event so uh, please feel free to ask any questions in between come to respiratory emergencies it can be uh, a sudden uh, episode occurring for a particular individual which would be the first episode that person would be having or it could be an acute worsening of a long term chronic respiratory illness so these are the most common conditions that you probably would face in the casualty uh, for for a patient who presents with respiratory symptoms that would be an acute exacerbation of a chronic respiratory disease the most common ones you would probably face would be copd and asthma then other conditions uh, our knowledge of interstitial lung diseases is still uh, you know, expanding um, maybe not as much as copd and asthma but still acute exacerbation of ilds bronchic diseases then uh, acute events like a pneumothorax could be the first episode post trauma or could be um, uh, recurrent patient presenting with recurrent episodes of pneumothorax that, that is also possible then a uh, patient may present with pneumonia pleural effusion uh, and how to assess the patient with pneumonia who might any time going for sepsis then acute pulmonary embolism which i think has uh, our awareness about pulmonary embolism as well as the incidence has also probably increased over the past few years with the advent of uh, after the covid pandemic has hit us mm -hmm. then congestive cardiac failure uh, patients presenting with hemoptysis and foreign body aspiration these are the few conditions which i would be discussing if there is anything else that you want to discuss we will discuss at the end of the class so uh, the major acute symptoms with regard to respiratory system would be breathlessness chest pain and um, blood in sputum or what we call as hemoptysis sometimes patient may present with strider uh, you would get an ent opinion as well sometimes it might be due to some other chronic respiratory disease like uh, obstructive sleep apnea also so these are the most important things that uh, would come to um, uh, and cough acute um, uh, you know, persistent cough would also be a symptom which presents to the casual so uh, how would you examine a patient uh, clinical examination general examination to assess the severity of uh, the respiratory distress like um, uh, if you patient has been having symptoms for some time like um, uh, uh, asthma attack which is uh, recalcitrant or a copd exacerbation uh, or even type 2 respiratory failure in a chronic uh, condition like um, obstructive sleep apnea or significant hypospolosis presenting with type 2 respiratory failure patient may come with uh, uh, a loss i mean diminished consciousness and uh, all those things and sometimes in severe mass uh, severe pneumothorax with the uh, um, uh, tamponade and also uh, pleural effusion and uh, those conditions may also present with uh, the patient in a uh, diminished consciousness level sometimes uh, with severe respiratory distress patient may be anxious like in asthma may not be able to speak uh, might be agitated such things can also occur then you have to assess the skin color pallor should always alert the uh, alert a, a clinician if the patient presents with hemoptysis that there is some either that he has been having symptoms since a long time it may also be uh, an evidence of uh, chronic lung diseases uh, or, or um, like malignancy uh, then internal bleeding all those things so pallor is a warning sign cyanosis uh, if the patient uh, you can uh, assess whether the patient uh, is in respiratory failure uh, it could be a patient with chronic respiratory illness clubbing in a patient usually uh, points to a chronic respiratory illness like a uh, bronchic cases or an interstitial lung disease or if it is an acute uh, thing that the patient can identify that my fingers were not like this then it could be a lung abscess uh, and also in, in a certain proportion of patients with copd also there could be clubbing general edema whether it is localized or generalized could be uh, uh, evidence of uh, chronic respiratory disease or heart failure then uh, look at the respiratory rate mm -hmm. now that we have the pulse oximeter people uh, actually uh, don't look at the pulse at all but uh, checking the pulse actually may give you <coughs> evidence 
whether the patient is having type 2 respiratory failure, patient might be having a high bounding pulse, uh, tachycardia, all those things that you'll miss. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, that also you have to look. In respiratory rate, uh, uh, you have to manually uh, count and assess whether it's uh, tachymic or not. Even um, observing whether the patient is having nasal flaring, uh, all those things can give you an uh, idea of whether the patient is in distress. Firstly, breathing, mouth, mouth breathing, uh, all those things are uh, um, signs of uh, COPD and emphysema. Then patient presenting with trauma, uh, even if it is any kind of trauma, if there, if there may not be, there might be only trivial chest trauma, patient uh, could be having an emphysema or maybe could be having a subpleural bleb or a bulla, which might actually uh, rupture, causing a pneumothorax. Then in RTA or in any other injury like we have discussed earlier, uh, please look for uh, any signs of uh, pneumothorax. And tracheal position usually is uh, uh, abnormal when there is loss of volume on one side or when there is uh, increased volume on the uh, affected side. So if it is a pleural effusion or a pneumothorax, then the tracheal will be shifted to the opposite side. And there is an acute even foreign body aspiration and there is lung collapse or uh, it is a chronic um, condition like a, a chronic tuberculosis with the fibro cavity, then the tracheal may be deviated to the same side. So a uh, brief history might help you understand what is wrong with the patient. So as is the symmetry of the chest wall, uh, you can look for uh, bulging or uh, in COPD, of course, uh, the, there'll be emphysematous chest, barrel shaped chest with widened in the postal spaces and all those things. But if there is specific history of trauma, then you have to assess whether there is fracture ribs, uh, any um, uh, evidence of uh, hyperinflation on one side to look for pneumothorax. Uh, kyphosis and scoliosis, uh, to observe for kyphosis and scoliosis is important because most of these patients with uh, spinal deformities and uh, chest wall deformities might present with um, type 2 respiratory failure and uh, uh, they may not give a specific history of any other illness and uh, you have to identify what is wrong with the patient. So clinical examination, uh, crackles or crepitations as they are commonly uh, you, you can get that in pneumonia, fine inspiratory, fine end inspiratory crepitations or velcro practice in patients with interstitial lung diseases. And if the patient has clubbing, patient has cyanosis, you might present with hemoptysis. And then when you auscultate, you get findings of uh, coarse crepitations. Then it could be a bronchitis. Then patient has um, chest pain, then um, a sudden acute, uh, even the breathlessness, some basal crepitations you can. You know, consider left ventricular failure. Bronchial, most of these conditions, uh, even uh, other than asthma and COPD, sometimes even patients with chronic uh, bronchial cases or even ILD may present with bronchial. So with the other added sounds, you can reach a diagnosis. And if, if the patient presents with an acute event, like uh, you know, a sudden episode of cough, uh, you can, uh, and followed by a localized uh, evidence of bronchi, then you have to suspect that there is localized obstruction, it could be a foreign body aspiration. Sometimes in patients presenting with uh, mild streaky hemoptysis, who is a chronic smoker, patient has clubbing, then you find that um, other than um, uh, you're not getting any specific findings other than uh, localized area of bronchi, then it could be a mass. Uh, the possibility of a malignancy is probably higher up in the list. The patient presents with fever. Uh, right side, uh, some chest pain and uh, 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 severe chest pain, which is typically pleuritic. Then you auscultate, and you can sometimes you are able to hear a pleural rub. Strider, of course, uh, uh, could be laryngeal edema, it could be foreign body aspiration. Uh, it's a loud, uh, uh, no, throwing noise for during inspiration. So, how do you assess these patients who present with acute respiratory symptoms? Uh, most often in the casualty, uh, like in our um, setting, we might not have much facility. And uh, I believe uh, even uh, ordering for an X-ray might not be very feasible. Sometimes you may not have enough time to ask for an X-ray. Like um, the patient might be uh, in circulatory collapse or in severe respiratory failure and you have to intervene. So, um, but uh, pulse oximeter, 
if possible uh, if blood gases and x rays can be ordered these are uh, actually adequate to manage a casualty the peak flow meter and the spirometry part comes later when the patient could be somehow stabilized and peak flow meter per se is usually used for um, uh, assessing the control of uh, some respiratory diseases like asthma but in an ac acute even when you need to shift the patient to the ward or to the icu also sometimes we can use that if you know the baseline value. so pulse oximeter like i was discussing usually the normal range is 95 to 99 but please be careful that uh, you know you, you just don't keep the pulse oximeter for a couple of seconds and look at the reading it will you have to wait until the waveform stabilizes and then make a reading might uh, take to 10 to 20 seconds or so uh, then only assess the uh, patient and sometimes when the patient is in circulatory failure you may not even get uh, a pulse oximeter reading and you have to go by your clinical skills and uh, then comes the blood gas values. If you are able to send a blood, blood gas, uh, these are basically used to assess whether the patient is in uh, respiratory failure, hypoxic or uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure. And it can actually help to assess whether a patient with a chronic respiratory disease needs to be uh, admitted uh, to the ward or to the ICU, whether he needs to be um, given non invasive ventilation, which is like positive pressure ventilation, uh, or where the patient immediately needs to go in for a mechanical ventilation. And also, uh, blood gases can be used to uh, decide on uh, assess uh, weaning protocols uh, when the patient is stabilized. So the normal values uh, in an arterial blood gas and venous uh, uh, sample are uh, different. But uh, there are some recent studies suggesting that even in emergency conditions, even a VBG can help you assess the patient. So in a venous blood, the partial pressure of oxygen is uh, very much low. And the pH is also on the lower side, towards the acidic side. So how do you assess whether the patient is in respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, like that? Uh, in respiratory acidosis, the normal P, the pH is uh, decreased. That is, it means acidosis. And the uh, PCO2 is will be more than 45. Usually you get this. Uh, condition in uh, in patients with COPD, uh, uh, COPD uh, respiratory failure. In uh, interstitial lung diseases, you might get more of a, the patient would be more tachymic, so which results in a respiratory alkalosis kind of pattern. Metabolic acidosis, as you obviously know, the pH would be less than 7.35, the bicarbonate would be low, and uh, then you have to rule out conditions like um, a patient could be diabetic, then you have to assess whether he's having um, diabetic ketoacidosis or is the, is the patient is in sepsis like that. And metabolic alkalosis, the pH would be high and bicarbonate would be 20, more than 26. Sometimes you get mixed patterns. Um, okay, so uh, first you have to look at the PaO2 level and if, if it shows uh, uh, decreased, whether it shows decreased oxygen, look at the pH level. The pH is acidic, acidic or not alkaline. Uh, then the PCO2 level. So if the PCO2 level is high and the pH is acidic, then it is respiratory acidosis. And if the um, pH is low and the PCO2 level is also low, it is probably respiratory alkalosis. Then look at the bicarbonate level. There is uh, whether it is if the acidosis is there, PCO2 is normal and the uh, bicarbonate level is low, then it shows metabolic acidosis. Uh, uh, like that. So this is one investigation. The next investigation would be uh, the X-ray if it is available. So uh, most often uh, it is very difficult to come in whether an X-ray is normal or not. If you have a pathology, sometimes it is e easier to make a diagnosis. But before commenting whether the X-ray is normal or not, we have to assess. Uh, we have to identify certain areas uh, which are called hidden areas. Yeah, some like below the heart, there could be a collapsed lung marking. Uh, a patient would probably have a history of foreign body aspiration. You might get a collapsed retrocardiac area. Then uh, look at the soft tissues. Sometimes a minimal pneumothorax may not be evident. Sometimes it may result in surgical endosoma. We have seen a lot of um, young females with asthma present 
with um, mild chest pain, but clinical examination may not reveal anything other than few wrong there. But sometimes they may get surgical emphysema and they might have minimal pneumothorax, which may actually, uh, you know, you have to decide on changing the therapy according to that. Uh, then, um, uh, so these things, then pulmonary vasculature, also you have to observe closely. So this, this is a normal, this is more or less a normal X-ray uh, where you can see the cardiac borders, uh, the pleural space. Uh, these are actually uh, man-made. You don't see the fissures like this, but uh, you can identify if, the, if there is uh, some haziness along this line, it could be the uh, there will be fluid inside the fissure like that. And there could be only slight blunting of the uh, costodiaphragmatic. Uh, uh, you can look at those and identify the patient. This is the peak expected flow meter and the spirometry. Uh, uh, this is peak flow meter is usually used to assess uh, the um, control of a uh, condition like asthma. You, you sometimes usually, uh, sometimes given for uh, asthma self management. Spirometry is basically used to assess whether a patient is having any obstructive or whether the uh, patient is having any pulmonary disease, which could be obstructive, restrictive, or a mixed pattern. Obstructive airway disease is basically COPD. Uh, and if it is a reversible obstructive airway disease, it is asthma. And uh, restrictive diseases, uh, restrictive pattern on pulmonary function tests, which can be obtained in uh, uh, diseases like interstitial lung disease, when the patient is not doing it properly, when the patient does not blow for four to six seconds, um, when the patient is having any uh, significant cardiac illness with uh, results in cardiomegaly, um, then chest wall deformities like that. So respiratory failure, I have mentioned. Uh, a type one is um, the uh, oxygen level would be low. The pH also would be low and, and uh, the oxygen level would be primarily very low. That is type 1 or uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. In type 2 respiratory failure, there will be usually respiratory acidosis and uh, uh, the PaCO2 would be more than 50. It can be acute or chronic. Acute uh, uh, type 2 and uh, core pulmonary could happen uh, in, in an acute exacerbation of COPD or the patient would be like, uh, innovation would be like uh, having a chronic obstructive sleep apnea and uh, a, a chronic COPD and he would be probably in a mild respiratory failure all the time. So we have to decide on management according to that. So these are the most common uh, respiratory diseases which cause uh, uh, respiratory compromise. Chest wall deformities I have already mentioned. Uh, then pneumothorax abnormalities like a pneumothorax, post-traumatic pneumothorax, or post-surgical pleural effusion in rhyme, all those things can uh, sometimes, if it is extensive, can cause hypoxemia. Uh, restrictive lung diseases uh, can occur in bronchitis, pulmonary edema, and, and interstitial lung disease. Obstructive airway diseases, respiratory infections, and vascular diseases, which are, we are dealing with a lot of pulmonary vascular diseases nowadays. So coming to the uh, topics per se, I think the most common condition that you would deal in the casualty would be asthma and COPD exacerbations. Uh, and and uh, uh, in, in particularly in elderly patients, especially females, sometimes it would be difficult to identify whether it is probably an asthma or a COPD, but more or less the acute management would be the same. Uh, but, and uh, the difference, uh, dif uh, the um, later management, once the patient is stabilized, then I think it would require some effort on your part so that the patient doesn't come back soon in the same state. So COPD, as you know, is a, uh, uh, is a preventable disease uh, and treatable, but it is usually progressive and uh, not so reversible as you would, uh, you know, in compar comparison to a condition like asthma, which is totally reversible and the patient can be totally symptom free in between exacerbations if the patient is taking regular medications or not exposed to uh, any aggravating factors. So COPD is usually progressive and with each exacerbation, with each of the casualty risks that the patient gets, his uh, lung volumes would progressively decrease and it is uh, each exacerbation uh, would lead to increased risk of mortality. And uh, an exacerbation, uh, if the patient is on medication, 
uh, exacerbation would be uh, a change in the patient's baseline breathlessness cup uh, and sometimes may be associated with uh, purulence of sputum, which indicates a uh, infective exacerbation. So the patient with COPD usually has cough, breathlessness and some amount of sputum reduction. So if it is more than what is there in the baseline, you can consider it an exacerbation. In Thalassica, it will do mild, moderate and severe according to the uh, requirement of medication service needed and the care that the patient needs to control the symptoms. Smoking is the most important cause and these exacerbations may be due to the patient could be a current smoker or patient would have had a recent exposure to uh, some pollution or allergen uh, or maybe due to a respiratory infection. But only one third of the uh, exacerbations are due to uh, infections and that too majority of them are viral. So uh, unnecessarily giving antibiotics would lead to antibiotic uh, resistance in these people. So uh, I think most of us are very well versed with uh, identifying a COPD patient. They have barrel. This is the typical COPD emphysema pattern and uh, the uh, chronic bronchitis person would be having, would be more of, uh, obese. So identify the patient with COPD. The monitoring would include continuous monitoring with the uh, pulse oximeter, the monitoring the saturation, uh, blood gas analysis to uh, detect whether the patient needs to be in the ICU or in the ward, whether the patient actually needs admission or can be managed from the casualty or OR. Uh, to identify whether it's a infective exacerbation, you would need to do blood counts and, and uh, a chest X-ray if the patient is having any uh, acute symptom or symptoms other than the baseline. Like, for example, worrying symptoms like a blood a hemoptysis, the patient would present, you have to rule out uh, pulmonary tuberculosis because most of these patients would be having recurrent exacerbations and would be treated with um, steroids um, over a long period of time. So anytime uh, tuberculosis, uh, if patient presents with uh, blood in sputum or changing symptoms, tuberculosis should be considered, particularly in our setting. Then, because uh, then if the patient is a very has a very high smoking index, there is always a possibility that this would be the first presentation of the malignant disease. Um, uh, then, um, such, in such conditions, identify whether the patient has developed a pneumonia. In such conditions, X-ray would be um, helpful. So uh, this is more or less a normal X-ray where you can the heart borders uh, there is uh, the lung markings are more or less uh, okay. Here you see the X-ray of the COPD patient where there is tubular heart, there is uh, the diaphragm are pushed down and there is hyperinflation. Uh, this is a reconstructed view of a COPD patient with the emphysema. You see the emphysematous bullet here. Here also you can see the emphysematous bullet, which is actually pushing the normal lung to one side, leading to respiratory compromise. So these patients have chronic progressive dyspnea, cough, increased sputum production. So identify whether the patient is deteriorating by looking for fatigue or agitation, decreased level of consciousness, there could be uh, a PCO2 retention. So in such conditions, or even hypoxia can uh, actually decrease the consciousness level. Uh, and check the uh, blood gas. Checking the blood gases would help to uh, identify the patient whether the patient is in type two respiratory failure. Uh, managing exacerbations uh, is uh, basically stabilize the patient, uh, and um, also all, almost because COPD occurs in the elderly age group, they might be having associated comorbidities like a hypertension, diabetes. Uh, coronary artery disease because smoking, which is the primary factor in, involved with COPD, may also cause other systemic abnormalities like a, uh, hypertension or a cardiovascular disease. So, uh, for control of comorbidities also is also very important in managing uh, COPD. So, when a patient presents with exacerbation, especially when the patient is elderly, ECG has to be taken to rule out cardiovascular uh, coronary artery disease. X-ray, uh, if there are in, uh, localized findings or clinical suspicion of a pneumothorax, pneumonia, uh, or, or even a tuberculosis or a lung cancer. Sputum may be evolved in uh, So uh, your question would be like, uh, patient would be presenting to your or casualty with recurrent exacerbations and asking for a nebulization or an injection. So how often should you send a sputum uh, or a sputum injection? 
one thing is if the patient comes back with recurrent exacerbation it means that our basic management of COPD is not right so you have to uh, control that and how often should you send us to them ideally uh, if the patient is having any change in symptoms or uh, at least once in three months is what we uh, uh, what we usually recommend uh, so if it has not been done in the last three months, the patient presents with uh, symptoms suggestive of any acute uh, symptoms, then the ideal is and should also be rapid. Then hospitalized patients. Once you decide that the patient needs to be hospitalized, in, uh, uh, admitted in the ward or in the ICU, then you can uh, decide, uh, categorize the patients with, uh, into patients with no respiratory failure, acute respiratory failure, but it is not life-threatening an acute respiratory failure, which can be life threatening uh, For COPD, there is uh, 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 there is also this concept that uh, uh, exacerbations can be mild, moderate, and severe. Mild exacerbations can be managed with the um, step up of uh, the inhalers or corticosteroids and antibiotics if indicated. Uh, uh, and moderate exacerbations uh, are for patients who have hypoxemia, that is, there is desaturation but there is no carbon dioxide retention. So those patients can be uh, probably kept in the ward, given some oxygen, managed with the normal protocol and discharge. Now, other patients with uh, type 2, they, they come into the group with type 2 respiratory failure. So they would have to be uh, admitted. Probably they would require some non-invasive ventilation like that. So uh, the admitted patients with no respiratory failure, uh, mild exacerbation of symptoms, uh, and they would just require some uh, admission or observation in the ward. And once stabilized, they can be discharged. With respiratory failure, uh, there will be tachypnea, uh, hypoxia would be there. Uh, then they would require uh, sometimes non invasive ventilation. So, if you like threatening respiratory failure, would, uh, the patient would have to be assessed. Uh, and sometimes these, these are the patients who would go in for mechanical ventilation. So inhaled bronchodilators or nebulized bronchodilators. And if nebulizer is not working, or if it is not available in the casualty, the patient has his own inhalers with him uh, uh, with a spacer. If you can deliver, uh, if, if the patient can use the inhaler with a spacer, uh, then that itself is adequate specifically, uh, like in conditions like asthma also. So if, if the inhaled medications can be given through a nebulizer, uh, you can actually give a uh, give uh, short acting liquor to agents like salvetamol with or without anticholinergic agents like ipratidine. And if uh, parental injections are not available, even oral glucocorticosteroids are as effective, provided the patient's uh, GI system is normal. And uh, as I mentioned, depending on the um, blood gas analysis, if it is possible, or if the patient is uh, uh, not improving with your nebulized medications, injection steroids, and, uh, and the saturation or the work of breathing. The patient's work of breathing is very much high. Uh, the patient is getting fatigued. You can consider non-invasive mechanical ventilation. That is, uh, during um, um, if it is available in the casualty, some of these patients can be put on non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And uh, if, if the patient, uh, I'll come to uh, when to consider for ICU admission in the next few slides. And also, um, many of these patients would be having a diabetic ketoacidosis or um, destabilized comorbidities, and you have to look at that part also. And all exacerbations of COPD do not require antibiotics. Uh, if there is increased breathlessness, increased sputum volume, or increased sputum goodness, or there is a patch or uh, which is suggestive of a pneumonia in the X-ray, then we would consider antibiotics. And some patients who are on mechanical ventilation would also be need to be put on antibiotics. When you see a patch like this, there is also the possibility that patient could be having a pulmonary embolism also. So watch out for other symptoms like blood streaking, sputum, um, and uh, mild fever or tachypnea. Uh, I think. Uh, how many of you have been using uh, non-invasive ventilation in the casualty or are aware of using non-invasive ventilation? Yeah, because I asked specifically because uh, the last time, uh, uh, I think many of 
uh, many of the uh, doctors who attended suggested that uh, uh, they are not aware of uh, or they don't have the facility in the casualty but there were a few who, who said that uh, they have this facility uh, and uh, patients can be observed for some time or later shifted to the ward so uh, in emergency department uh, or in the majority of hospitals this is available in the tertiary care centers uh, sometimes uh, it is basically used for uh, type 2 respiratory failure where um, the pH would be less than 7.35 and uh, the patient uh, is having this work of breathing and it's not improving with oxygen and the usual symptomatic measures. Uh, this can be tried, but always assess uh, whether the patient is conscious uh, and after if a blood gas analysis can be repeated after two hours, then uh, we need to do that and decide on whether the patient can be continued with the non-invasive ventilation or needs to be put in the ICU and it can be reinforced. Uh, this, this the, these are the criteria for non-invasive ventilation. That is uh, PSO2 or type 2 respiratory failure, pH less than 7.25, increased work of breathing. Uh, so when the, the patient is unable to tolerate NIV or when the patient has some uh, trauma, facial trauma, or re had a recent surgery uh, in, in cardiac arrest with uh, diminished consciousness or having uh, severe vomiting or suggestive, uh, uh, and he's not able to control his respiratory symptoms, secretions, and the patient is not hemodynamically stable. Non-invasive ventilation is not advisable and uh, probably uh, would have to consider mechanical ventilation um, after assessing. So, uh, so these are uh, the conditions, uh, these are the indications for hospital admission. Uh, that is, uh, if there is marked increase in intensity of symptoms, severe COPD, it's not a mild, mild COPD, very ex uh, extensive COPD, uh, new onset of physical signs like a uh, patient is having hemostasis or other conditions, uh, failure of exacerbation to respond to initial medical management, serious comorbidities, uncontrolled diabetes or hypertensive crisis, such things or a com a comorbid uh, coronary artery disease, such conditions, old age with poor uh, in or insufficient home support should also be admitted. So that is COPD. So asthma exacerbation also presents in a very similar way with acute uh, respiratory distress. Only thing would be the asthma population would be probably younger age group, usually has a family history uh, or, or a previous ectopic history. Or another thing would be patient is suddenly exposed to some uh, allergen. Uh, and these patients, maybe they are uh, on, uh, they have been already diagnosed and are on control with uh, controlled with uh, their usual medications, but has had a uh, recent infection or some precipitating factor which brings them to the casualty. Uh, and uh, most often these patients are anxious and restless, but once the patient you find that, you know, there is a history of asthma and the patient is unable to even talk. Uh, and, um, and when you auscultate, there is, there is um, hardly any uh, breath, breath sounds or no added sounds, then you have to be uh, very careful. It could be um, a sudden acute severe asthma and patient might suddenly collapse. Uh, and you have to rule out other conditions. Uh, maybe in a uh, slightly elderly patient, acute left ventricular failure, acute uh, inhalation of smoke like uh, we had in, uh, uh, in Cochin. Uh, some uh, these patients uh, may present with a, uh, a patient with an asthma can present with an exacerbation or somebody who is predisposed or a, has a hyper reactive airway may present with a first episode of acute uh, breathlessness after this such events and uh, also rule out acute pulmonary embolism. If you get a localized wheeze, please suspect a localized obstruction. So this is just a flow chart okay. it shows how to uh, manage a patient with uh, acute asthma, assess whether the patient is having uh, desaturation. The oxygen saturation is maintained, but the uh, patient is uh, more or less symptomatic. Uh, then we can actually start with the 
and nebulizer is not available, patient can be given uh, short acting bitter to inhalers, 4 to 10 puffs by pressurized methadose inhaler and a spacer or nebulization with salbutamol. Is, this can be repeated every 20 minutes or can be continuously given for uh, that is either 20 minutes apart or you can do continuous nebulization. Uh, if uh, parental steroids are not available, oral prednisolone can be given. For children, it should be 1 mg per kg body weight or otherwise 0.5 to 0.5 mg body weight up to a amount of 40 mg. Controlled oxygen is required and uh, reassess. And if the patient is uh, uh, improving, you can keep in the OR and dis discharge direction. Uh, if on inhalers, you have to optimize the inhalers and uh, check whether he's using the inhalers correctly. Uh, if it is a severe exacerbation that patient is in distress, there is a significant desaturation, uh, uh, then uh, you can actually give, um, or if the patient has a life, uh, transfer to an acute care facility and high oxygen. If the patient stabilizes, uh, you can leave the um, and finally, if it is worsening, then may have to see it. So there are a few things in the ICU uh, um, uh, for asthma. Usually, non-invasive ventilation is very severe, severe asthma, and severe hypoxia for invasive mechanization. Uh, for the other patients, uh, you have those two medications. Uh, assess whether the is taking regular regular inhaler. Slide the patient develop the exacerbation and exposure all due to different has um, then there, there is being called the, the concept of stepping up of the medications, which is usually steroids and long ergonomics. Uh, to step up various few weeks, optimized symptoms. Them control is thing. Then step down uh, after reviewing total control, and it is only done at an interval of two to three. And all when the patient comes with an exacerbation, he is uh, complained to inhale medications with required. When discharge uh, the asthma patients, they have to be told that the exacerbation is stopping the the in control, then you have to tell it. Uh, they might uh, mild exacerbations during respiratory conditions or the exacerbations, and in that case, then use uh, the inhalers and of uh, extra. You have to step up the inhalers for also when you have a prescription. Is followed up. Uh, in both COPD and asthma, needs to be followed up to check for the proper use of patients. So coming to condition and in this time the respiratory care, they mentioned these patients they have increased respiratory rate and they would then uh, respiratory health close. Most common so patient is have comorbid condition is um same also present like uh, so when and acute of the uh rapidly disease like um, acute industry something so the differential diagnosis uh, of the hunting kind infection um, there could be new slab because some of the disease some of the drugs that we use to treat interstitial um, uh, respiratory diseases can also cause interstitial lung disease then most of these patients have other comorbidities so it could be cardiac decompensation and one major thing is look for pandre embolism so once these other things are ruled out uh, uh, if it is an acute exacerbation of an ILD per se that is worsening of the disease process that is defined as uh, there is previous or Current, uh, concurrent diagnosis of an interstitial lung disease with unexplained development of worsening of dyspnea, the CT or X-ray showing increased uh, lesions, 
and other conditions like the pulmonary infection and cardiac causes are ruled out. Then the interstitial lung disease was worsening, and uh, you have to um, uh, investigate with appropriate uh, blood investigations to rule out infections. Echo can be uh, asked for to rule out a cardiac decompensation. Pulmonary embolism should be ruled out. And uh, depending on the level of respiratory failure, patient might require admission in the ICU or in the ward. Other than oxygen supplementation, some of these patients might be on already on long-term oxygen therapy. And even with the long-term or the supplemental oxygen, if they are deteriorating, then it is an exacerbation. So uh, oxygen supplementation, then treatment would be to intravenously give corticosteroid therapy. Sometimes pulse with 73 to 1 gram either prednisolone and, so and maintain with 0 0.5 to 1 milligram steroid. Other, other drugs which are used uh, usually by a specialist is the intravenous cyclophosphamide. And treatment of infections is usually given because it's very difficult to identify a worsening of ILD from a worsen, uh, from an acute infection. And most of the most common thing would be an atypical um, infection. So uh, the macrolides or any uh, antibiotic which covers atypical organisms or even viral uh, fevers can be used in such conditions. And uh, patients uh, with interstitial lung diseases uh, are suggested mechanical ventilation with a guarded uh, prognosis because once ventilated, it is very difficult to wean them off the ventilator. And some of the exacerbations can be managed with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So bronchitis, I think, would be another condition which presents to the uh, casualty. Uh, they'll be having chronic uh, symptoms, sputum production, uh, and sometimes they may present with hemoptysis. And uh, treatment of uh, such, in, uh, most of these patients would have done sputum culture at some point of time. So this uh, sputum culture done has identified some organisms who can actually start that particular antibiotic uh, if he's had a previous sputum result with them, or uh, they may be given uh, amoxicillin, uh, um, or if you have, if you can do a sputum culture at that point of time and treat accordingly. And other conditions like hemoptysis and breathlessness should be managed uh, with uh, um, symptomatic therapy. Uh, so, can you see this X-ray? Any diagnosis with this? Pneumothorax. Yes. So you can see. So, uh, Madam, uh, what would you do in this condition? Intercostal tube. Yes. Okay. In this particular case, uh, uh, the, it is a young patient. I would say, like, if the patient is sometimes we get, uh, this is a very large pneumothorax. And even with this, sometimes the patient may be asymptomatic, particularly in young males. Uh, it could be a primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, and if the patient is asymptomatic, there is always the possibility that it might expand without an intervention. But if the patient is symptomatic, yes, this uh, actually requires an intercostal drainage uh, insertion. So uh, it should be suspected in all patients with acute dyspnea, sudden onset pleuritic pain. Um, and uh, it should be actually confirmed with a chest X-ray. But if the patient presents with an acute event with, uh, uh, I have seen patients with a uh, hemithorax bulging and patient in respiratory distress. So in such cases, you may not even get enough time to put in a uh, intercostal uh, drainage in the proper space with uh, you know, support. So sometimes you may need to intervene by putting in a needle and relieving the distress. So the, uh, I think we'll come uh, to that in the later slides, but uh, the second intercostal space would be the safest side, side to put the needle. Even a small, uh, whatever uh, uh, needle that you can get to relieve the pressure, large bore needle ideally would relieve the pressure in such conditions. So uh, uh, suspect a pneumothorax in all acute exacerbates of COPD, when you have the previous X-ray showing a bullet, you can always rupture. And any patient who's had a chest trauma or assault or whatever should be looked for. Look to check to see whether he has a pneumothorax. 
So we have an area of hyperlucency that we saw in the last X-ray. So this is the hyperlucent area. This is the collapsed lung border without any apparent underlying pulmonary disease. Can be due to rupture of air containing space. Bleps, sometimes in asthma, young females with asthma also bleps, that is, uh, which occurs in patients with uh, underlying lung disease like the COPD um, uh, with a bullous disease or sometimes even in uh, bronchitic, so bronchitic cases also, this is can rupture and develop a pneumothorax. Interstitial lung diseases, which uh, are present with pneumothorax like uh, lung and cell histocytosis, lung. such conditions are also there. Even idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, sometimes you may get uh, pneumothorax. Then trauma can be hydrogenic during a pleural aspiration or any other <laughs> surgery or um, accidents. So usually these patients have sudden onset of pleuritic chest pain and increased breathlessness. Sometimes these patients might only have chest pain, no breathlessness at all. And uh, they present may present with hypoxemia, hyperexpanded hemithorax, and tracheal deviation and subcutaneous emphysema are seen in severe cases. And you have to look for these clicking sounds or crunching sounds, which is usually seen in uh, pneumomedias time. Tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. So uh, uh, any patient who shows disproportionate distress and you have other clinical findings of hypoxemia, tachycardia, there is media standard shift to the opposite side. History of trauma is there. There is no harm in trying, checking whether the patient has uh, a pneumothorax. So particularly before, uh, our primary concern would be to stabilize the patient and putting in a, uh, you know, what we do, like an endotracheal intubation. But it is, but intubating and mechanically ventilating a patient with a tension pneumothorax would be uh, very dangerous. So if the pneumothorax is corrected, then it is better. Then we can stabilize the patient also. So make sure that you put in a needle if these findings are there. Uh, this is a site for aspiration. In the second intercostal space at the midclavicular line. And later, uh, once the patient is relieved, you can get uh, uh, you can negotiate for time to put in a uh, intercostal drainage tube. So. Uh, sometimes the X-ray, even even uh, pulmonologists uh, at the referral center, we have uh, sometimes difficulty in identifying very small pneumothorax. Uh, and uh, the only option would be to give oxygen. Uh, and uh, some uh, there may be associated effusion in some patients. And in uh, the patients who are in the ICU patients, sometimes will be mechanically ventilated. They may, there will be. Uh, the pneumothorax may not be identified very easily. So look for something called a deep sulcus sign. I'll show you an X-ray later. Uh, and CT scan is recommended when uh, the, the diagnosis of a pneumomedia stain is suspected or the X-ray is normal, but uh, you strongly suspect a pneumothorax or if you suspect an underlying lung disease. So whether, uh, like uh, uh, the earlier participant said, whether uh, you can decide on whether to put an intercostal drainage according to some of the X-ray signs. So there are two, <laughs> two decisions on this. Um, either the, uh, the area from the apex, you can make out it is a full pneumothorax. If this distance is more than three centimeters or the lateral distance is more than two centimeters and the patient is symptomatic, and the patient is symptomatic, then you can put in a uh, intercostal drainage. So look for sufficient significant dyspnea, uh, in, uh, then other conditions the, you know, to assess whether the patient is deteriorating, JVP, distension, hypotension, distress, then you may need to put in the ICD. So the consensus, like I mentioned earlier, asymptomatic patients with small pneumothorax should be managed conservatively and observed. Uh, the observation period would be three to six hours. Oxygen can be given uh, to help. It is not to, uh, you know, even the patient may not be having desaturation per se, but when you give oxygen, it can uh, increase the absorption of the pneumothorax at a rate uh, almost up to fourfold. So the resorption rate varies from 1.25 to 2.2% of the hemithorax volume. And uh, all these patients, if there is history of smoking, then should be advised to stop smoking. Uh, then large primary spontaneous pneumothorax <clears throat> uh, can be, uh, uh, 
we actually sometimes try observe just observing with the oxygen the patient or if it is very large like i showed like the x-ray that i showed you can actually try aspiration and if the aspiration uh, like you do pleural aspiration and if it is not expanding then only we can try a uh, uh, intercostal drainage so this is the algorithm it is This is the sign that I was mentioning. In an ICU patient, look for the deep sulcus sign. Patient might be desaturating and uh, you may not know why he is desaturating. You find all the other things are clinically stable, but this could be a sign of pneumothorax. And in such cases, if the patient is mechanically ventilated, then putting in an ICD is a must because otherwise uh, the rest will be respiratory component. So when you put in an ICD, this is the uh, this these are the this is the intercostal space. So you put in the needle uh, or uh, the catheter through the upper border of the lower rib to prevent damage to the vascular bundle. And the ideal site is in the anterior axillary line in the fifth intercostal space usually, so that the patient is more comfortable. His uh, arm movements will not be impaired. And uh, sometimes in uh, excessive emphysema, you can, the intercostal space can be one space lower down also. So this is how you put in a intercostal view. Mm. There are certain things to uh, assess when the patient is uh, being discharged. Uh, if the patient has air travel, then air travel or is involved in some job, uh, which uh, includes like a, uh, diving and all those things, then it's always better to do a uh, pleurodesis. So in such cases, it's better to refer to a higher center for uh, better opinion. Uh, pleurisy and pleural effusion. Pleurisy, acute, uh, sh may, may, there may not be any evidence of uh, any effusion or uh, anything at that point of time. Could be associated with an infection, can be managed with antibiotics and uh, anti-inflammatory measures. Uh, the X-ray may not show anything, so clinical finding uh, you can start medications. Pleural effusion. Uh, sometimes the patient may present even with a mild effusion. Patient may present with fever, severe chest pain, and uh, in distress. But sometimes you are, you'll be surprised to see that the patient has been having mild symptoms for a few weeks, and then he presents with uh, progressive breathlessness, more than pain. So, uh, and intervention is needed. Mild effusion, you need to, uh, maybe you can try a course of antibiotics and uh, observe whether it is uh, resolving. Major effusions, like you see here, this is, this is actually a massive effusion. Uh, that is, uh, it's almost up to the second intercostal space. So, such conditions would need to be uh, uh, intervened therapeutically. So, there would be uh, evaluation needed to rule out whether it is tuberculosis or a malignancy. Usually, massive effusions uh, have underlying lung diseases like this. So, this is, can anybody say what this is? I do remember. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is a post aspiration x ray of one of our patients. So, it's uh, very often. Uh, it, it, Usually, with a pleural effusion is aspirated, you don't get so much of a uh, hydronumothorax. So, um, there could be some underlying malignancy or an underlying damage done. Uh, or even small pneumothoraxes can be produced after post aspiration. So, always ensure that you do a x ray after uh, pleural aspiration. Uh, so, coming to pneumonias. Uh, so, these are the uh, third leading cause of mortality in the world. And when, when patients present with symptoms suggestive of pneumonia, you have to assess whether the patient uh, can be managed from the casualty or OP or needs to uh, receive um, intensive care treatment. So assess whether the patient uh, is having any uh, significant illness by using a very simple score for the curb 65, which is where the C stands for confusion. This is blood urea nitrogen. This is um, um, around 40. So in our milligram per deciliter, respiratory rate more than 30. 
uh, there is hypotension or age more than 65 years. So if the score is more than one or two or more, the patient should be considered for admission. Otherwise, you can manage the patient from the casualty itself. So when a patient presents with uh, pneumonia, if an X-ray is available, uh, then you can assess whether there is significant consolidation uh, and manage accordingly. Otherwise, if the X-ray is not available, but there are symptoms suggestive of pneumonia, calculate the top 65 or the CRV 65 score. There is desaturation. Uh, then, uh, if that is, if it is a young patient, age less than 50 years, but saturation less than 92, or an old patient, age more than 50, with saturation less than 90, um, uh, it can be uh, or, we can manage on an outpatient basis. Otherwise, patient needs to be uh, evaluated in a critical care setting. So you can, this is a very simple score and you can assess uh, whether to admit or you can manage on the OP. Uh, then uh, if the patient is having desaturation, patient needs to be given oxygen. Uh, if the patient is not having any type 2 failure, like a COPD exacerbation, COPD exacerbation usually uh, the um, rate of oxygen which is given is low flow oxygen, that is one to two liter per minute. Uh, so if the patient is having severe hypoxemia uh, in, in pneumonia, you can actually give high concentrations of oxygen. Uh, then patient should be assessed for volume depletion, start an IV fluid, uh, check whether the patient has any comorbid conditions and start uh, uh, Specifically, if the patient is admitted in an intensive care facility, a prophylaxis for thromboembolism should be given. Then uh, we always are worried what kind of antibiotics can be prescribed. Usually, community acquired pneumonia, that is, the patient does not have any healthcare uh, or uh, any recent hospital admission or healthcare visit, then only we suggest that it is a community acquired So, here we can give amoxicillin. Uh, and if the, if the patient is um, sensitive to um, penicillin, so then we can consider something like a doxycycline or a macrolide, acetromycin or claritomycin as appropriate. Even patients who are admitted, they, their first choice would be penicillins. And only if the patient uh, is uh, uh, sorry, sensitive or allergic to penicillin, then we consider other conditions. And the basic thing is to remember that uh, uh, we should not use phenolox uh, as, as far as possible. And uh, especially drugs like ciprofloxacin, uh, uh, the respiratory phenolones would be levofloxacin, loxifloxacin, or um, medicines like that. So, but usually used with caution. So, unnecessarily writing phenolones should be avoided, particularly with the background that we are having in the resistance as well as the risk of um, tuberculosis in such patients. Uh, in patients who are admitted, uh, here also the first preference would be combination of broad spectrum beta lactamases, uh, even injections uh, amoxiclab can be uh, given and uh, with the macrolide. Macrolide would be astromycin or clarithromycin. And if you need to put uh, in patients who are allergic to penicillin, second generation cephalosporins, third generation um, or third generation cephalosporins. But the new concept is that any history of exposure to cephalosporins predisposed to antibiotic resistance. So as far as possible, use them with caution. And uh, these antibiotics can be later de-escalated or stepped down once the culture reports or clinical improvement is uh, achieved. So we'll come to the other condition. This any any take on this X-ray. So um, ARDS or a viral pneumonia can be suspected with this patient. With this, or even an acute worsening of an interstitial lung disease would be a few of the differential diagnosis with this X-ray. But this is uh, almost like a white out lung. So uh, by definition. Uh, it is a clinical syndrome which they, where the patient presents with uh, breathlessness, rapid onset hypoxemia, and diffuse pulmonary infiltrates. Should be uh, so we have uh, uh, if we have provision to check the blood gas analysis and know what 
oxygen concentration the patient is on, we can calculate the P by F ratio and assess whether the patient is having ARDS. Uh, so there usually there are usually predisposing conditions. Uh, there are direct and indirect causes. Direct causes would be something which affects the lung, like a pneumonia, pulmonary injury, near drown, inhalation, and aspiration of gastric contents. Inhalation injury, like uh, we have every possibility of dealing with in the recent times. So indirect injury, like sepsis, severe trauma, pancreatitis, and multiple transfusions in patient presence with severe hypoxemia with an X-ray like that, you have to suspect ARDS. Usually there are three phases, which is for theoretic uh, knowledge, exudative, proliferative, and fibrotic. And uh, uh, managing this, it in the exudative phase itself uh, decides the outcome of the disease. Patients are critically ill with significant desaturation. Uh, all these lab investigations can be asked for. Uh, a, a brain natriuretic peptide is to assess whether uh, to differentiate it between a cardiac failure and a ARDS. CT test can be suggested. Uh, we, to some extent, we can identify whether it's a viral pneumonia or uh, a proper ARDS. Then echo, rule out cardiac failure. Uh, these are indicated only, thromboalveolar lavage is indicated to identify any other um, um, cause for the uh, event. So this is a differentiation between a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is the closest to differential diagnosis for ARDS. And here you can get cardiomegaly that may be associated uh, poor effusion also. Here you, do, you, you don't get any, uh, you know, you get uh, non-homogeneous opacities involving all the zones. There may not be any significant cardiomegaly. There will be infiltrates all over the uh, lung. So this is the CT picture. Here you can see the septal or the, you know, this is seen in pulmonary edema, two areas of ground glass in this is This is the patchy infiltrate that you get in ARDS. So basic thing is would be to treat the underlying condition uh, and targeted, uh, specific therapy targeted lung injury. Like uh, if it is an infection, you have to treat that accordingly. Uh, supportive therapy for non-pulmonary causes. So patients would require, uh, there will be significant hypoxemia. Uh, if not mechanically ventilated, we, we have newer devices like high flow nasal catheters, uh, which has been used during the COVID pandemic. And uh, even high flow oxygen can be tried. And if the patient is not improving, then only uh, we need to go for mechanical ventilation. Uh, pulmonary embolism is a, a major uh, disease that we come across. That we have come across in the recent times. Usually, these patients have some uh, significant uh, risk factor for developing pulmonary embolism. Usually, it results from a deep vein thrombosis. Risk factors like hyperpyalidity, venous stasis, endothelial damage, which is called the Gershaw trial. Uh, so. Uh, uh, these things can be promoted by uh, heart failure or arrhythmias, pregnancy, birth control pills, prolonged bed rest, post-surgery, metastatic cancers, genetics, and in the recent times, even a COVID infection or a vaccination has been shown to predispose patients for pulmonary These patients present with acute chest pain, breathlessness, may or may present with hemoptysis, uh, and uh, only one third of these patients present with typical DVT like uh, brain and edema. So, watch for tachypnea, tachycardia, hypoxia, hypoxia, fever, sometimes cyanosis. Localized stress findings may be uh, present if the patient has had a pulmonary infarction. And the mortality is very high. Uh, you can ask for x ray, uh, blood. Uh, the most important investigations would be a chest x ray, B dimer, ECG and echo and CPPA, but it may not be always available in the casualty, but what we can, uh, so what we can do is having a very high uh, clinical suspicion for uh, these patients. So you, you can uh, actually rule out a pulmonary embolism. Uh, there are, these are the criteria, the younger age, there is no tachycardia, no desaturation, no hemoptysis, no history of any estrogen use, 
no uh, no risk factors and no previous thromboembolism or no unilateral these conditions actually rule out a uh, probable pulmonary embolism but the risk for developing or the uh, risk factors for developing pulmonary embolism can be calculated uh, by this score uh, sorry that is um, the age previous dvt or pulmonary embolism recent surgery active malignancy limb pain then clinical signs like heart rate um, tachycardia ta and uh, pain in the lower limbs and considering the score calculating the score you can know whether there is high or moderate or low risk for developing pulmonary embolism and the wells prediction score uh, also can be used uh, that is look for dvt symptoms heart rate mobilization similar to the previous one and we can assess whether there is a possibility of a pulmonary embolism or not so even with uh, uh, considering the risk factors we can assess whether the possibility of pulmonary embolism is high moderate uh, or low and look for investigations these are the typical ecg changes that are described s wave in the lead one q wave in uh, lead three and uh, in t inverted t waves but most often we, we do not get these typical ecg findings uh, x ray findings we uh, with so there are certain x ray findings with which we suspect this is almost like a pulmonary infarction there is a consolidated area there could be a embolus somewhere here in the blood supply that is uh, the vessel that is supplying that area then um, there are uh, prominence of the pulmonary uh, vessels patient sign and western mark sign can also be these are signs suggestive of pulmonary embolism these are uh, ct pictures where the this is the main, uh, pulmonary vasculature and you can see that this uh, there is occlusion of the main pulmonary vessel here then make out the lesions uh, last on this here there is also associated occlusion so look for these uh, clinical findings uh, if the patient is deteriorating there will be hypotension sometimes cardiogenic shock and worsening dyspnea so in patients with uh, hemodynamic instability if there is facility for a bedside echo then that can be done there is uh, no evidence of uh, rv dysfunction uh, then we can look for other causes if there is evidence of rv dysfunction usually a ct pulmonary angiography is advised and based on the findings uh, treatment can be started especially for a high risk patient the patient is not hemodynamically uh, unstable then assess the clinical probability with the scores that i have already mentioned uh, if the patient is having a low or intermediate risk d dimer which is actually uh, it's a negative if the d dimer is uh, negative there is very less chance for the patient to be have to have a pulmonary embolism so it is a it has a negative predictive but if the uh, d dimer is high or the clinical risk factor by assessing the risk factors if there is high chance of a developing pulmonary embolism you can directly ask for a ctpa even uh, what we have done in our clinical practice is that even uh, before waiting for a ct pulmonary angio or um, you know, if there is high risk of the patient going in for pulmonary embolism we can actually start uh, therapeutic uh, sorry prophylactic doses of antibiotics so uh, pulmonary embolism per se manage once the event has occurred Uh, one is prevention by uh, prophylaxis. Then, if the event has occurred, then you suspect yeah, that there, there is high suspicion. Then you can actually start heparin infusion, and by uh, later on bridge with warfarin, patient can be admitted. Uh, so, what we uh, if there is hypoxemia, we can give oxygen to relieve the pain. We should give uh, morphine, uh, maintain an IV axis. Uh, and uh, anticoagulation. Uh, usually, we give heparin or maybe uh, and uh, low uh, low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinex uh, or unfractionation heparin. So these are the doses. Uh, another thing I would like uh, is for patients who have uh, increased risk of uh, um, you know, like patients with malignancy or. Uh, who are on palliative care? They, these patients have uh, pro 
probable risk of developing further episodes. So they should be uh, put on long-term anticoagulants. Then thrombolytic therapy uh, with significant pulmonary embolism can be done with uh, these other conventional medications like streptocinus, urocinus, and ASCO, alteplase. Uh, these are the newer ones, tenetic place, etc. And surgical embolectomy may be uh, required in certain conditions like massive pulmonary embolism. So uh, anticoagulation is actually contraindicated uh, where the stroke, etiology of stroke is whether it's a bleed, whether it's stroke in the previous six months with uh, intracranial bleed and um, CNS neoplasm, major trauma or head injury the previous three weeks, bleeding manifestations or active bleeding. So you have to assess uh, how to uh, go about it by titrating whether you would probably need a multidisciplinary approach to that. And uh, these are just for awareness. We have facilities like um, vena cavel filters for uh, uh, patients with, um, you know, long-term malignancies or the persistent uh, uh, de development of uh, further embolus from the deep vein thrombus. Uh, Cord pulmonary is usually uh, patients presenting with a chronic respiratory disease, presenting with right ventricular failure. So. Uh, it, you, you might be very familiar with these patients presenting with a history of COPD or um, um, ILD, suddenly in a decompensated state with generalized edema, fatal edema, etc. So we can manage the basic underlying condition and also treat with oxygen uh, medicines to enhance the contractility of the ventricle and uh, decongest the patient. So any, any idea what this is? What you see is that uh, these lesions are typical of there's a cardiomegaly and these are perihilar shadows. Any any uh, pulmonary edema? Yes. So here also, actually, these people have history of uh, previous uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, maybe sometimes uh, acute even may be precipitated by inhalation to these uh, toxic fumes and uh, or uh, some drugs or fluid overload or uh, all those things. So basically, we have to uh, decongest the patient. Uh, oxygen, diuretics, uh, and cardiac control trivity agents. <clears throat> So uh, we will come to hemoptysis. Um, can anybody tell me what is the major cause of death in hemoptysis? Is it due to bleeding? Okay, so uh, blood in sputum or hemoptysis as we technically term. Uh, the condition is um, yeah, the cause of death is basically uh, asphyxia. That is when the major airways have, uh, are choked with blood, which floats. Uh, so you know, can the amount of blood can vary depending on um, uh, if, you know from two hundred to one liter. And if it is massive hemoptysis, it's usually dependent more than six hundred ml in twenty four hours. But even 200 ml is life threatening because that is the amount of blood that is required to uh, chalk your um, that space, like the major uh, the trachea and the main thrombus. So that even that amount of uh, blood can choke you and can lead to asphyxia. Uh, mortality ranges from 7 to 30 percent for non massive and uh, more than 80 percent for massive hemoptysis. But only less than 20% of hemoptysis are considered massive. So, we have a lot of conditions uh, which present like this. So, our first thing would be to identify whether it is hemoptysis or hematemesis. So, hematemesis will be preceded by nausea and vomiting, and the, uh, there would be food particles in the, uh, the expectation of uh, the fluid that comes out. And then, uh, patient. With hemoptysis, when the usually patient presents with hemoptysis, you would have had previous history of any uh, some some of the lung diseases like chronic cases would have 
that previous history of tuberculosis, uh, malignant or you know, suspicion of malignancy, things like that. And most often the uh, bleeding is from bronchial arteries. Uh, and this some range issues here. So I'll just cut out the video. Uh, and if, if it is uh, if the bleeding is from the bronchial arteries, as would be seen in patients with uh, post TB uh, seculae, then the bleeding would be rather profuse. While bleeding from pulmonary arteries is not so profuse. So we have uh, we can have a lot of conditions associated with hemoptysis, like uh, cataminal hemoptysis, patients who are on medications, even aspirin can cause uh, blood in the sputum. Patients uh, pressing in with acute pulmonary edema may mimic hemoptysis, acute sinusitis, um, uh, then lung abscess, pulmonary embolism, all those things should be ruled out with their specific characters. Uh, then uh, patient who is on, who is a current smoker with weight loss, <coughs> associated hoarseness uh, with history of COPD, then possibility of lung cancer is high. Uh, and such conditions should be asked for and uh, the investigation should be based on that. So acute management uh, would be, uh, we can ask for an X-ray, which would probably help you to make a diagnosis. X-ray, if the X-ray lesion is uh, localized, like for example, you have a right upper mid cavity and the patient presence with hemoptysis. Uh, along with the further investigations, you can actually ask the patient to uh, lie down on the same side of lesion so that uh, the uh, expectation of blood is decreased. So that would also help. Then other investigations that you can ask for is a bronchoscopy and the CT pulmonary angio or an echo. So, uh, Rule out the other causes like sinusitis, etc. Uh, based on the type of lesions that you see in the x ray, you can uh, identify certain diagnoses. Like uh, if, if the x ray is normal, then it could be some upper airway disease or a acute bronchitis or even a pulmonary embolus. That is very, uh, that is to be dealt with caution. Cavity lesions can be tuberculosis, lung abscess, or a cavitating malignancy. Uh, all those things should be looked out, uh, looked for in the X-ray. So, for example, this is a CT with a uh, fungal ball. So, this is this can present with hemoptysis, cavitating lesions in the X uh, CT. Then, this could be a malignancy which erodes into the bronchus and can present with hemoptysis. Small focus, focus of uh, a granulomatous lesion, a post TB seculae. Uh, consolidation, cavity uh, presenting with hemoptysis could be bronchitatic cyst or a large cavity. So initial management, resuscitation, airway protection. Like I said, if, the, if there is massive bouts of hemoptysis, if the lesion is localized, you can ask the patient to lie down on that particular side, sedate the patient, uh, and uh, hemodynamic stability has to be achieved by maintaining an IV line. Uh, correcting the blood loss, correcting the hypoxia with oxygen. Uh, and uh, like uh, if it is uh, pneumonia, you can start antibiotics if needed. Otherwise, if there is persisting hemoptysis, uh, you may need to localize the bleeding site and stop the bleeding, which can be done with a bronchoscopy. Uh, uh, surgical option would be at a later stage. But another option that uh, we have is uh, going for a bronchial artery embolization. So the patient is having persistent hemoptysis. You can ask for an interventional radiology opinion and uh, they can actually identify the bleeding vessel and block this or occlude this using uh, certain uh, things like a, um, a PVA. There are certain gel, gel form. There are certain uh, in, in organic, uh, sorry, inorganic substances which can be used to block this uh, bleeding vessel, so which is called bronchial artery embolization. And finally, we have a surgical option. Uh, the patient can be stabilized, and if it is a localized lesion, then uh, such conditions can be removed by a surgery so that further episodes of hemoptysis is prevented. I think uh, this is the last one uh, where uh, we, this is also, I think, uh, very important because we have lost our colleagues due to um, 
aspiration of food particles. So this is also a major issue, not even not only in children but also in adults. Uh, sudden onset of uh, breathlessness following, you know, while patient is laughing or eating food, and uh, acute, acute presentation. Diagnosis occasionally by a chest X-ray, but most often if it is taken in the acute phase, there may not be any signs of collapse or localized lesions in an X-ray. And the identification can be done only through a bronchoscopy, uh, and which can be actually diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Sometimes uh, chronic aspiration, you may not even remember that you aspirated uh, a peanut or something long back. Later on, uh, patient may pres uh, present with hemoptysis, uh, signs of infection, and uh, foul smelling expectations. Such conditions, uh, you can actually go in for a bronchoscopy and identify the uh, obstructed airway and uh, can also be therapeutic. The, uh, uh, the first slide I showed you the most important sites of aspiration, uh, lower, uh, but uh, the foreign body can be aspirated into any area depending on the position of the patient during aspiration. So um, diagnosis, usually if there is a lesion uh, or if uh, there is a foreign body, it can be uh, bronchoscopy is the definitive thing and it can be due to and uh, during uh, done with a rigid bronchoscope or a uh, flexible bronchoscope. But rigid bronchoscopy is preferable because we can take out the particles. So for emergency management, uh, this is what is done for children, but for adults, you can do the English maneuver. Um, you can actually bring the, or if the patient is uh, cannot be lifted, you can put the patient, uh, you know, um, ask the patient to sit down, bend in half, and give a forceful uh, kits between the shoulder blades to expel the body. body. So uh, sometimes post aspiration, we can we may need to uh, uh, give antibiotics, some uh, steroids for inflammation, and uh, if there is uh, uh, you know evidence of formation of the lung abscess or a consolidation of the lesion, we have to treat it accordingly. Yeah, the first one is on uh, whether the intercostal drainage can be uh, needle can be put in the second intercostal space. Uh, Retaining it there in the referee, or you can connect it to a, uh, what is that, the IV drip set and an underwater seal, and that would be better. Or you have to continuously aspirate. Uh, so, you know, just putting in a needle and leaving it open would be slightly tricky. Or you can connect it to a IV line and, you know, insert it into a uh, bottle with water. So, Positive pressure ventilation after placing. Um, I think uh, if it is a very uh, large pneumothorax and you are giving positive pressure ventilation, uh, just a needle in place may not be adequate. So it's always better to insert an ICD, proper intercostal drainage, and then prefer the patient. I think somebody was answering my question on what causes. Death in hemoptysis, make out the side of hemoptysis. Uh, clinically, uh, like uh, for example, if a patient says that the patient has pain on some particular site, or uh, uh, we have previous images uh, or x rays uh, that the patient uh, has you know, localized lesion on each side, then we, we can probably think that it is the same site that is affected even now. Uh, or um, that would be the only option. Otherwise, it would be probably difficult to get a uh, make a diagnosis of which side is affected clinically alone. So it probably would need a radiological imaging. Derifilin uh, per se uh, for acute exacerbation of COPD. Derifilin per se, most of the guidelines do not recommend. Uh, but in our setting, I think it's the only available proper dilator which can be described and the uh, problem with therapy is that um, it can cause various arrhythmias even convulsions in high doses. You never know. 
this patient would have gone to and some other PHC and has come to your PHC. So you might have received some medications from there and would be coming to you. So if you're just pushing directly and without understanding what the patient has been receiving, it might precipitate an event and uh, may not go well. Uh, so uh, Dexona is okay. Whatever steroid that you have, you don't have uh, all steroids. Uh, or if you don't have uh, the other steroids uh, to relieve the symptoms, Dexona can also be used uh, as per the dosage recommended. So, any other questions? Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, regarding hemoptysis, ma'am, if we receive a patient with hemoptysis, uh, usually uh, they give a history that they had one or two episodes in the morning or the previous night. Sometimes if it's only blood screening, it's, uh, you can, if the patient is not actually willing for admission or for referral, you can actually manage it uh, considering that, uh, you know, uh, depending on the previous history, like uh, if it's a post-TB secular, you know that the patient has been treated for tuberculosis. And you have to rule out whether it is active tuberculosis this time. You can make your clinical judgment on that. Patient is willing uh, for admission, you can admit and evaluate. Otherwise, if it's only blood streaking, we can take a chance, uh, treat with antibiotics and hemostatics. Advice um, you can actually advise uh, avoid strenuous exertion or strict bed rest like that. And ask the patient to review with the appropriate evaluation. Otherwise, uh, to Medical legally, it could be safe to admit because uh, we have seen patients with blood streaking just uh, walking across to the bus stop and uh, collapsing with a massive bulk. So, medical legally, I think you, you advise and you record that you have advised admission like that. Whereas, you can treat with antibiotics and uh, as required. Standard, standard, standard.